Let's turn our attention now to the gospel according to St. Mark. This morning's lesson is in chapter 9, verses 42 through 50, and I'd ask the congregation to stand for the reading of the Word of God. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. Better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. For it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be seasoned with fire and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt loses its flavor, how will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. These are hard sayings that come to us from the lips of our Lord, but this is God's truth that you have just heard. Please be seated. Let us pray. Father, even now as we deign to think the unthinkable and contemplate that which is most dreadful, we need Your help. We ask that in Your mercy, by the assistance of the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of truth, we may hear Your Word and embrace it. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Before I give any exposition of the text that I've just read to you, I want to alert you to one of the ways in which we assume the New Testament records were put together in their final form as individual gospels. It is pretty well established that, as was the custom among Jewish rabbis, that the rabbi would impart his teaching to his students, and which teaching the students would then memorize, and then later on could recall it and apply it to given situations. And it also seems evident that before the Gospels were written down, there was a body of what was called logia, or an oral tradition, among the apostles where they had this body of information that had been preserved, and they had the editorial freedom to put the teaching of Jesus in whatever circumstance best suited the intent or aim of the individual gospel. And so here we find some of those sayings of Jesus that Mark, for his reasons, place at an immediate context of chapter 9, even though they would be found in a different context in other gospel accounts. But what is important now is not so much where they're found in the gospel narrative, but the content itself. And so let's look at that. In verse 42, Jesus said, "'Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in Me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he 
were thrown into the sea. This is the first warning that Mark gives us in this section, and it has respect not so much to children as you might expect from the translation here when Jesus talks about, if you cause one of my little ones who believe in me to stumble, our minds would jump to the conclusion that He's speaking of little children. No, He's not. He's speaking about the rank-and-file believer, the simple Christian, the Christian who is not sophisticated in his learning, but with a childlike faith, seeks to be faithful and obedient to Jesus. And Jesus warns that if people who are puffed up with knowledge, puffed up with their status in the church, use their arrogance to cause the simple Christian to stumble, that that person is exposing themselves to great chastisement from the Lord. And Jesus makes a comparison here when He said, be better for that person to have a millstone tied around their neck and thrown into the sea than to cause one of the little ones to stumble. That's an awesome burden placed upon leaders in the church, on pastors, on people in positions of authority, on teachers in the church, that they don't destroy the faith of the little ones. You see what happens every day in our country today, in seminaries, in colleges that are supposed to be Christian colleges, where the students come as freshmen excited about their Christian faith, and their faith is systematically attacked day in and day out in the classroom. And I can remember that experience that I had as a college freshman, and then in seminary where our seminary professors told us that if we believed in the substitutionary atonement, we were fools. And we saw the Orthodox faith systematically attacked every single day. And I dread to think of the future of those teachers and those leaders who go about this task of trying to undermine the faith of believers in Christ. Now, here Jesus introduces a metaphor that's graphic and terrifying. He said, it'd be better for that person if they had a millstone tied around their neck and they were cast into the sea. Now, think of that image. In the ancient Jewish community that was an agrarian society, one of the most important products they produced was grain and the grain would be ground on the threshing floor, and there would be this huge stone that was used to grind the grain to produce the flour and the wheat and so on. And the millstone that was used in that process was so big and so heavy that no human being was strong enough to turn it, with the notable exception in the Old Testament where in his slavery the strong man Samson was required to take the place of the animals that turned the millstone, and he was reduced to the status of a brutish animal to do that task. But the task was so difficult that it would take beasts of burden to move that stone around. Jesus says, take a stone of that weight, tie it around the neck of the person that injures the little ones. That person would be better off to have that millstone around their neck and thrown into the sea, which for the Jew, remember, the sea was always a symbol in Jewish poetry of terror and destruction. And so Jesus uses strong language here, strong metaphors and images. But if you think the images of the destruction of those who destroy the faith of the little ones is severe, let's look further at the rest of the text. Well, now he says, 
If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. For it's better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell. Now, what Jesus does here is makes another comparison. In the first place, he's understanding the Jewish tradition that repudiated any acts of self disfigurement. In the Old Testament, it was a serious sin for people to disfigure their own bodies. The Jews were not like the Greeks who despised all things physical. The hands, the eyes, the feet were seen as gifts of God to be enjoyed in this life. And so, a person's hands, a person's legs, a person's eyes were seen by the Jew as a most precious possession. And yet Jesus says here, as precious as your hands are to you, you would be better off to cut off your hand and be maimed like that rather than to have two hands that you take with you to hell. And in like manner, he says, if your foot offends you, it'd be better to cut it off and be crippled than to have two good legs that take you to hell. If your eye offends you, you'd be better to pull it out than to have perfect vision that takes you to hell. So the obvious comparison that our Lord is making here is that whatever is precious to you, no matter how precious it is, it is not worth having as much as it is worth having the kingdom of God. The worst calamity that can befall any human being is to go to hell. Now, we know that in former generations, preachers would preach fire and brimstone sermons, warning their flocks about the imminent danger of going into hell. But in the 21st century, the doctrine of hell has all but disappeared from Christian preaching. And people don't even want to think about it, or if they do think about it, they water it down to such a degree that people are no longer living in fear of going to hell. How many people walk through their lives in this day, give much thought or concern about going to hell? How much time have you spent in your life worrying about your final destiny, worrying about whether you might, at the end of your life, be consigned by God to everlasting punishment? Jonathan Edwards, who was an expert on this subject, says, the most wicked, impenitent sinner in this world constantly assures himself that he will escape the judgment of God. And God's patience, by which the judgment does not fall on us already, instead of leading us to repentance, leads us to a false sense of security, to being at ease in Zion, say, well, God hasn't punished me yet. Obviously, all this talk about Everlasting punishment is just a scare theology that has no correspondence to reality. Well, beloved, here's what I want us to see this morning. Nobody in the Bible talked more about hell than Jesus. Secondly, we need to face the reality that Jesus talked more about hell than He talked about heaven. I wonder why it is that so much of what the Bible teaches about hell 
comes to us from the lips of Jesus? I can only guess at the answer, and my guess is this, that we would scarcely believe it from anybody else. We hardly believe it from Jesus. And if Jesus didn't say anything about it, and instead it came from Isaiah or Jeremiah or Peter or Paul, we could then dismiss it as saying, that is not the teaching of Jesus. But the reality is, we hardly believe it when it comes from Jesus. Little Jesus, meek and mild, the Jesus of love and of mercy and of grace is the author of so much of the biblical information about the doctrine of hell. Now, before we go on with this, I want to say this, that people ask me all the time in teaching theology, they say, R.C., do you believe that hell is a literal lake of fire? And my normal response to that question goes something like this. Well, I doubt whether hell is literally a lake of fire. It may be, but I doubt it. And when I say I doubt it, you can feel the relief of the people. They sigh and they say, oh, we're so glad to know that. And I say, wait a minute. Before you feel relieved about it, you need to ask some more questions. Why is it that when Jesus talked about this problem of hell, He used the most ghastly, graphic images of punishment that He could think of? And then think about this, that in most cases, when we use language symbolically or figuratively, we understand that the reality that we are describing by the symbol or by the figure is more intense in reality than it can possibly be in the symbol. Let me say it again. The reality is more intense than the symbol. And if that's the case, then my guess would be that the sinner in hell, dear friends, would do everything they could to be in a lake of fire rather than where they are. Then I hear people say, well, what hell really is is the absence of God. And again, the breath of relief is given with a gasp, oh, is that all? Is that all? The absence of God. Let me say two things about this. We are glib in describing calamitous earthly situations with our language of hell. Common is the expression, war is hell. We hear people all the time describing the misery that they've experienced with their afflictions or whatever has disturbed them, they'll say, I've been going through hell. My life has been hell on earth. You've heard those comments. You've heard those expressions. Maybe you've used them yourself. When I hear people say, war is hell, or I went through hell, or my life has been a living hell, the first thing that they are saying to me is that they don't have a clue about the reality of hell. Because we would find right now the person in this world who's still alive and is in the worst state of suffering of anybody on this planet, that person still enjoys a certain measure of grace at the hand of God. But to be removed totally from the mercy of God to have Him take all of His grace away from you is an experience that I wouldn't wish on anyone. So the first thing about this business about being 
separated from God, is that, again, people don't realize what a dreadful thing it would be to be totally separated from God. That's one part of the equation. The other part is paradoxical. On the other hand, there is nothing the sinner in hell would wish for more than to be separated from God. Let me say it again. There is nothing that the sinner in hell would wish for more than to be separated from God, because God is there. And He's there with His wrath, with His punitive judgment on people. And it is a fearful thing, a dreadful thing, as the Bible says, to fall into the hands of the living God, to be exposed day in and day out to His wrath. Well, how long does it last? You know, there's been this movement in the last 20 years in the evangelical world to discount hell in terms of the doctrine of annihilation. The idea is that what happens to the sinner who is not redeemed, the impenitent person, is at the end of his life, when he draws his last breath, that's what it is, his last breath. He has nothing to fear after death except eternal unconsciousness, because he will be blotted out of existence, and the eternality of his punishment will be simply that which he misses out on. He will miss the great joy for which the believer has been made to look forward to with the everlasting life in the presence of God and with Christ. And so the person's hell, according to annihilationism, is that he misses all of that, and he misses it forever. But there's no ongoing punishment after death. As soon as the person dies, they go into oblivion, and that's it. In a very real sense, they've gotten away with their cosmic rebellion against God in their earthly life. Now, over against that view, which has been deemed heretical for 2,000 years, is the biblical idea that hell has no ending point in time, that the punishment goes forever. Now, I struggle with that. I can't imagine any Christian not struggling with that. I, as I said, I wouldn't wish for my worst enemy to be in hell for five minutes, let alone to be there forever. I just can hardly contemplate such a dreadful thing. And I hear it when people say to me, how could God be a good God and allow people to suffer His punishment forever? And of course, the answer to that, glibly, if you will, is that because He is a good God, and because He is a good God and He's a holy God, He will not look through His fingers at human sin. He has appointed a day of judgment for those who refuse to leave their sins and cling to the Redeemer. Now, if I can make this on a personal note, I have to say this. As much as I've struggled in my lifetime with the very idea of hell, when I think of people I know who in all probability died in their sins, to think for a moment that they're there is more than I can bear. However, as God is my witness, if God spoke audibly right now and said, R.C., your destiny is hell. And you are consigned to the outer darkness forever. If I heard those most dreadful words from the mouth of God, obviously I, I would be devastated. But I have to say this. I know that if I heard those words from God, 
I would have no right to complain. As much as I hate the thought of anybody's going to hell, I know it would be perfectly just of God if He sent me there. That's why I cling to the cross, because that's my only hope in life and in death, to escape the wrath that is to come, that Jesus went there for me is the only reason I don't have to go. But if I did have to go, I would have no grounds to complain. Now, let's look quickly at the images Jesus uses here when He says, it's better to go into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, and then again with the foot, into the fire that shall never be quenched, and again their worm shall not die and the fire is not quenched. And then a third time, it'd be better to have one eye plucked out than to have two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Do you hear the refrain that Jesus uses three times? The worm doesn't die. The fire is not quenched. What's the point of those graphic images? Well, to understand that the principal image for hell that is used in the New Testament and the word that is used beginning in the Old Testament days is the word Gehenna. And the word Gehenna is related to an area, a geographical area, just outside of the city of Jerusalem in the Valley of Hinnon, which became known as Gehenna. And the Valley of Hinnon is this steep ravine that is on the southwestern corner of the city of Jerusalem. And if you look back into the Old Testament book of the Kings, you will recall that during the reign of Asa and of Manasseh. The people of Israel got involved in one of the worst of all pagan practices that ever infected the people of Israel, and it was the sacrifice of human beings and of children to the pagan deity Moloch. And this was one of the darkest periods in the history of the Old Testament where not only were the people worshiping pagan gods, but they were offering human sacrifices to this repugnant deity, Moloch. And of course, this came later on under the judgment of the prophet Jeremiah and finally in the reign of King Josiah. Josiah put a stop once and for all to these human sacrifices to Moloch. And what Josiah did was that he wanted to de-consecrate the place where they were making these human sacrifices. And the place where they were making the human sacrifices were just outside the city of Jerusalem in the southwestern region, which in order to add insult to injury to that form of paganism, King Josiah turned the traditional place of human sacrifice into a garbage dump, and it became the garbage dump for Jerusalem. So the refuse from the city, the offal from the animals was carted out on a regular basis and dumped into this massive garbage dump outside of the city that was always burning with fire. That's how the Jews got rid of their garbage, in this huge burning garbage dump. And because garbage was added newly and freshly to it all the time, they didn't have to ignite the fire one week and then again the next week and then again the next month. The fire never went out. And the worms 
that we're eating, the carcasses of the animals, never ran out of a food supply. Think about it. Worm, in this case, was a parasite. And the worm would eat the host. And when the host would die, what would happen to the worm? The worm would die unless he was supplied with a new host to continue his parasitical existence. And it's those dreadful images that Jesus uses to paint the picture of hell. Hell is a place where the worm doesn't die. Because the host is never consumed. You believe in the resurrection of the body? The Bible teaches not only the resurrection of the body of the saints, but also the resurrection of the bodies of the damned. that they may be fit to receive their everlasting punishment in hell where the worm never dies, when nobody ever pours water on the flames and the fires never go out. If Jesus ever used ghastly images to speak of the duration of eternal punishment. It was these images of the worm and of the flame that he could look and point to the object lesson of the garbage dump and say, see that? Those fires never stop. Those worms never die. And you would be better off to have your hand cut off, your leg cut off, your eye plucked out, then with a whole body and all of your possessions, go to that place. You see, Jesus said there is nothing more valuable than the kingdom of God, nothing worse than the abode of the damned. And He put that before His people. That's why He said it's worth an arm and a leg. It's worth your eye. It's worth your hearing, your seeing. It's worth anything to get that pearl of great price and to flee from hell. If you've never thought about it before, think about it now. And ask yourself, not where am I going to be next week, because you don't know. Where am I going to be next month, because you don't know that. You might guess, and you might be correct in your guess. But ask yourself this question today. Where am I going to be a hundred years from now? You will be somewhere. And you'll be conscious. You'll be awake. You'll either be among the damned or in the state where joy never ends, and felicity is never dampened, where before your eyes will be every second the beautiful vision of the loveliness of Christ that you will gaze upon forever. If it takes an eye, an arm, or a leg, Make sure you're there and not in hell.